This place is cool. Thank you so much. I'm uh, at some point I'm gonna, this wall's gonna go away mm -hmm. and I'm gonna make a big like songwriting deck out there. Cause That's I cool. like to go outside. We have a little mini spot out there. But my mom came in here and spruced the place up and she's obsessed with putting like photos of me with all these people everywhere. So this is like a mother's doing. I love how you came straight crowds. in and you and you zeroed in on the thing that I would have gone to and you've justified it without me even raising it. It's my fucking mother <laughs> came here today. I'm like, yo, why? Cause my mom, she just is like, you know, she wants me to be proud of my moments, but yeah. it's just very like, it's cute in her house. But in my house, I feel like it's kind of like a, a, like a whole dentist, you know, when you go <laughs> and you're like, I don't really care whose teeth you clean. Like you go to their dentist as well? Yeah, can you clean teeth or not? I go to their like, dentist. I don't, I don't care about the pictures on the wall. It's so LA. How you doing? I'm doing really good. I'm happy to be talking to you. You too. I was thinking it's nice to actually, out of all the times, you know, COVID has just been just so hard on everybody, whether yeah. it's actually physically getting the illness or yeah. just mentally and spiritually, or, you know, so many people are just experiencing anxiety and fear, but... The one great thing is, you know, to bring you to my studio, bring you to my home. Yeah. We've never been able to sit where I was thrilled. the music really gets me. I mean, when so. it came into my diary and it's, I was like, well, where are we doing it? And they're like, well, it's it's at Miley's place. I was thrilled because you're right. It started out in our place and then it was COVID orientated TikTok. Yeah, I don't like that, especially nah, with you and me. You know, you want to have a real conversation. Yeah. And I think with that, I think timing is everything. You know, I learned that whether that was in love or relationships or just comedy. I mean, just even to to make people laugh, to make people cry, there's a mm. timing to all of it. And when you lose that timing and that connection and that awareness of, okay, I'm sensing what you're feeling, you're sensing what I'm feeling. Mm. When you lose that, I think that's what's kind of been causing some of this anxiety and fear because there's an unknowing of the response, you lose that when you're talking through a screen. Well, the core of anxiety and fear is, is a desire for control. Mm -hmm. And we put that in the same conversation as time. Yeah. And that's why when things happen to you, it's like, oh, I have the worst timing. Yeah. Oh, I can't believe this time that happened. Yeah. And it's interesting that you would look at it from a different perspective of like, actually, I lean into the concept of time, even if at the yeah. time, it felt like a bad time. Also, I think there's something about you kind of fall into the right timing. And I think there's been times where I've wanted to rush and times where I've wanted to wait. And there's just seasons. And that's been this record for me because mm -hmm. this record I really was patient with. Mm -hmm. And patience, you could probably get a lot of adjectives of the things that I am. But patient, I don't think if you asked anyone around me would necessarily be so. Yeah, but you were sort of pushed in that direction, right? Because it's so funny. I was thinking back to the, to the last time we really spoke. Well, around the last album, which was Younger Now, album mm -hmm. album. And it's funny, that title, you know, because I think about like, you were really, you were on a mission to mature and to, mm -hmm. to build a life for yourself, to stabilize yourself. And yet you called that album Younger Now and it all felt, it just felt very at odds. And mm -hmm. then 2018, the whole thing just tips upside down as you wrote so poignantly in your note. Mm -hmm. And I think about that, that's a push toward patience because mm -hmm. that's about losing control. You can't control that. That must've been probably looking back on it now, the most significant, one of the most significant events of your life, that fire. I write down everything. Like I, my dad always says, you know, when you write it down, when you say it out loud, you give it power. Mm. You, you begin to create it the minute that you write it down. So I write everything down. You know, I did write about, I guess it was a push into patience, but it's now a part of my character. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I really am proud of. And it, I feel it was earned um, to be patient. And as much as there's things that I'll miss, it really, what I gained which patience being one of them was worth it. In a sense, finding a balance of feeling detached, but still being able to connect, Yeah, you know? Yeah. I would never want someone to say, you know, she just wasn't there with me. She just, you know, I, I, I do have a problem with people that, that think being protected or guarding yourself in some way. Is detachment. Is detachment because if you don't protect yourself, then like take all the locks off your house. Leave the keys in the car. Sure. Don't wear shoes on your feet. Well, also, you have a right to keep something to yourself. I mean, yeah. is it you or yourself before anybody came into your life, ultimately outside yeah. of, you know, the family that you have. And mm -hmm. even then, the minute you're born, it's your journey. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, I've always wanted to ask you this, as you now get to a higher state of self-awareness through your music, through your life, through learning, through relationships, through all of it, through maturity, right? Mm -hmm. It's called maturity. Do you look back now on what you were told by your parents, what you, how you acted as a kid, the yeah. kind of kid you were, from the, you know, they all loved to have the earliest memories. Have you always been this? No, I mean, I am not the person I was yesterday, 
you know, mm -hmm. last night sitting behind you cutting with Stevie Nicks on the phone, that changed me forever. You know, everything changes me forever. And I'll never be who I was yesterday in a way every night before I go to sleep, I say goodbye to myself in a way because it's like that person's done. And there's like a sadness to it at sometimes because I do evolve really quickly because I'm very absorbent. Like I just take everything in. Yeah. And recently I've had to do inventory of what I've owned as mine that isn't mine because I think, like you're saying, your parents, so whether it's generational or the way that you're raised or, you know, you, you really do get passed through DNA, yeah. personality and character, even fear. Yeah, nature um, versus nurture, for sure. You know, exactly. Nature versus nurture. And we're all just an equation of all those things adding up, you know. The last three years, I called it the, the cocktail of chaos because it just felt like the worst bartender ever, which was, I guess, <laughs> the universe. Yeah. Sometimes just kept pouring the shit and you're like, oh my God. Like, I can't you drink know. any more of this shit. Yeah, and you're just like, you know, you're dizzy off it. That's what I mean. Like when we spoke in 2017 and the album was coming out and you were just like, I got this. Yeah. Like, I got the relationship. I got the album. Yeah. I got that life. I'm good. Yeah. And then, whoosh. And life just laughs. It's like, you're not done yet. You know, I, I kind of hate the saying, but also love it that when you make the plan that life, you know, laughs yeah. at you. Because yeah. I do think there's something to having an idea of what you want and like setting a goal and seeing it. Mm -hmm. You know, I daydream a lot. Daydreaming and like seeing it all happen, but not letting it completely consume you to yeah, the point where there's no other shake options. Shake you exactly and yeah. become, look, I, I never let an idea or a schedule determine my creative choices. So... Listen, like I made a record, you and I had talked during Younger Now, and then I was going and making a set of three EPs, which were amazing. I was in love with the songs, you know, but those two EPs weren't relevant anymore. And even though I love the songs for what they were, they lost their relevance. So to me, <laughs> I can't ever release that. It's the only thing that you did in that equation that, that doesn't play to how you would do that now is you announced it. Yeah, When exactly. you announce it, you get that's power the, to that's it. That's the plan. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. then it goes upside down. I didn't realize you lost stuff, though. Oh, yeah. So every computer, every journal, every song I'd ever written, you know, and I write a lot of songs that no one ever hears. They're just for me. Mm -hmm. Actually, yesterday I was going through, I have a Joan Jett book, and I was looking at some pictures of her getting inspired, and I was like, Shit, we have the exact same handwriting. And I realized it was my handwriting. I had used her book as my songwriting journal. So, you know, if I don't have anything, you just pick up a record and just, write, just on write on it. And so I was like, man, me and Joan do have a lot in common. I even have her handwriting. And then I realized <laughs> that's my handwriting. Yeah, I do not remember her writing about like, you know, floating through space with an astronaut. So that was like in my dead pet studio, I had had a book sitting here on this console. This console survived the fire. Wow. This is from my studio in Malibu. Good on and you. Um, yeah, my dad actually was like, can I have that? I'm like, dude, this is what I, the one thing that we really had left was my freaking console. It's mine. He's like, I know, but I just got the perfect compressor. I need a place to put it. Like, you have to get your own damn console. This is like, because my studio was the only thing that was left. Yeah. So this kind of from here and those signs, those were. That's, that's a the sign, only, That's right? the only thing I had left was my studio. That's all that was left was my music. Wow. Oddly, you know, I didn't have a lot of my songwriting journals in my studio because that's never, I mean, for me, that's never where I write a song. I never write a song in the studio. Can I ask you a really weird question? I've never asked anyone because yeah. it was such a, it's such a unique experience that you go through something as kind of traumatic and, and life-shaking as that. Mm -hmm. What is it like when you walk through what used to be a home? Dude, I mean, part of you wants to just start digging through ashes and find whatever is left, yeah. you know? So part of you wants to do that. And part of you creates the the walls and the, the what was there, and you can almost see pictures. I mean, part of you, you're, I guess it's somewhat of muscle memory of some kind, you yeah. know, starts putting it all back together again. And then a part of you is very peaceful. I also am very fortunate because I knew that I would have some place to go, that I would not be displaced. Yeah. And that's so not your the security's same. checked. My security is fine. And I know that about my life. I never stop being grateful for that. My life is extremely unique and I'm sometimes feel overly fortunate. And I had my own guilt with that, you know, so 
Being there, there was a sense of peace knowing that there was nothing I could do about it because there's times where me wanting to control has been able for me to create this authentic brand. I never do anything that I don't want to do. My music is exactly what I want it to be. Being in control a lot of the time works in my favor. But being obsessed with control can also be really damaging to just being in what the plan that the above has for you. So I battled with that, but I more so, I really felt at peace knowing that there's nothing I can do about it. And I've taken that peace and I try to find that space because there's a billion other times in your life that there's going to be nothing that you can do about it. Having that that freedom now of not being just so in love with control has been really good for me. Yeah, it's funny you talk about that because if, if I go through and I read it from an altitude mm-hmm. and I sort of cherry pick the events that we've all seen and heard, so that's the trade of mm-hmm. being a performer, I suppose, is that stuff gets put out there. It does feel like the moments when things have taken you in a vastly different direction have been the moments when you, on the outside, have been in complete control. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I thrive in in chaos a little bit. And I yeah. also, I don't like making decisions. This is one thing that I don't like. I do not like, if someone asks me to go to dinner, you choose. Like, I do not like making. Oh, that's annoying. I don't like making decisions. That's because annoying. I really am kind of happy anywhere. Right. I just am. And Until you're not. Until until I'm like, this place sucks. But I'm <laughs> exactly. like. Exactly, I mean, it's no. so obvious. But really, I really like people kind of, I mean, when it comes to my music and to my craft, I really, really like making my own choices and making my own art, but those aren't really decisions. You know, those aren't, to me, those aren't decisions. They're probably very big decisions if you're not used to making them all the time. But like putting out music to me isn't a big decision. It's like, it just is. Like it's just flowing out constantly. So I liked that I never had to make a choice about saying goodbye to that house. It just said goodbye to me. There was no choice in it. And I really liked that about about the non-decision-making process. So it's been a year I mean, if this is still the case and no judgment, but from mm-hmm. what I can tell, it's been a year since you chose sobriety, right? Since you yeah. decided to clear your head. Yeah. How did it feel when you started to wake up and realize that that was working? Well, I, like a lot of people, you know, being completely honest during the pandemic, fell off and oh. felt really a lot of, you know, and I would never sit here and go, I've been fucking sober and I didn't and I fell off. And I realized that I now... I'm back on sobriety, two weeks sober, and, you know, I feel like I really accepted that time. And one of the things I've used is don't get furious, get curious. So don't be mad at yourself, but ask yourself, what happened? But isn't that a step towards moderation? Look, I'm not trying to speak for anybody here because everyone has their own battles and some things affect people in far more volatile ways. I'm from New Zealand. Yeah. Moderation's kind of in our blood. Yeah. Right? So... You know, from my perspective, it's like if if you're curious, why why do you need to make a statement either way? I guess. So is the I didn't choose to make a statement. I think that somehow, I remember it was like a couple months ago, and I was doing an interview, and the conversation just came up, and I think I said it just like I'm talking to you, and sometimes I forget because like I think it might have been with me. It might have been like a real conversation, like how I said right now. Listen, I fucked up. Like I I wasn't sober yeah. like over the last couple months, and to me it was a up because I'm, I'm not a moderation person. Right. And I don't think that everyone has to be fucking sober. I think everyone has to do what is best for them. I don't have a problem with drinking. I have a problem with the decisions I make once I go past that level of, right. you know, even even into, you know, I, I just been wanting to wake up 100%, 100% of the time. Yeah, I get that. And I get dialing, you know, the numbers and reaching out to people that I've detached from purposely. But when we drink, sometimes there's almost like no future. Whatever you want right now, I become very impulsive. Yeah. We're all going through the same thing. We're all this kind of malleable experience. Mm -hmm. You came out of this world at a young age where it was like, you can't be malleable. Yeah, I know. Exactly. Yeah. It's a very obvious observation. So apologies if it's just pure cliche. But do do you personally trace it back? some of how you want to break free and just live in the moment, Mm -hmm. it can trace that back to this idea of like, you got to button up here. You got to do things the way they're done. In a way, I feel really grateful that I had all that like training and experience. And How so? Because I would think of myself as a, um, I'm very diligent. And if I want something, I usually can get it. And that taught me a lot about that. Like, I'm very resilient. You know, I 
like a lot of the qualities that became embedded in me mm-hmm. by my upbringing, which my upbringing was not normal. So you know? disciplined? I'm very disciplined. Yeah, very disciplined. That's why it's never easy, but it's pretty easy for me to be sober or in and out of sobriety because right. like the day I don't want to fucking do it anymore, I don't. Done. The day that I do, I do, yeah. you know? And, but when I don't want to, it's really, it just is. I'm just yeah. very disciplined. And so there's something about that that I really like. And I would say that there's a level of professionalism that I would bring to any craft. Even if that was working at a restaurant, I would be just totally obsessive about being the best one, you know? And so there's something about that that I really like. That's a button you switch, though. I've seen you turn it on where it's just like, I'll slay this room, Uh huh. right? But then I've also seen you seemingly walk into a room very safe in the knowledge that you can do that mm-hmm. disciplined thing. Well, that's confidence. And, and, and then go, I'm going to do the opposite. Yeah. I'm going to, like, set fire to it. Yeah, well, that's having, like, a security that I've, I used to be able to call on it and find it. Mm. And I guess now still, you know, I have moments of of my weakness and like the humanity takes over sometimes. But most of the time there's like a, a level of security now. And I see it every time I'm scared. I just picture Glastonbury. It makes you want to crawl into a hole where no one can find you. And I did not want to go on that stage. <laughs> I was so terrified. It's scary. I had never been more terrified in it's my scary. life. It's scary. I'm still on that stage. I it's hadn't scary. prayed in 10 years. I prayed. I got on hands and knees and prayed like, please. Like, I was thinking I'm actually going to have a heart attack. Like, I was like, oh, I'm actually just going to fall to the floor and faint. Like, I, because most of the time I envision and see myself doing it, f- like, thoroughly already. Like, I, I see everything that as if it's already been done. Yeah. I couldn't see it. And that's all I kept saying was like, I don't have any premonition about this. Like, I cannot see it. That's fear. I I was so terrified. And when I thought about it, I just saw like dark, like I couldn't see it. And I was so terrified. And, you know, luckily it made sense to have my dad come because he did Old Town Road. But really, I just wanted my fucking daddy. Daddy. I was scared. And, you know, I haven't called him daddy because I'm scared of something in freaking 15 years. And I was like, yeah, I'm scared. When I'm terrified... And I feel the lump in my throat and I can tell my, you know, that lump in your throat's my heart coming up here and my yeah. stomach is down here. I just really picture Glastonbury. And I encourage everyone Have that. to name their Glastonbury. Yeah, for sure. What's the scariest thing you've ever done and got through? Yeah. And that can even be a loss. You know, I guess probably one of my bigger fears was losing my grandmother who's tattooed on my arm. She was all she ran my fan club for 10 years. Mm. My grandma took me to do everything. She literally opened every letter from a fan for 10 years. Every single one and wrote back like love Miley's mammy every time and losing her. And so that can be your glass and berry. You know, it doesn't have to be that. It can be anything. What was the thing that you were the most afraid of and you conquered it? And then find that, you know, so it's like finding the peace in the fire when you're standing on top of the ashes of your home and I found peace. You can train your brain to find that again, you know, and that feeling. And so I just encourage you to put a pin in moments where you feel like you conquered something and then just try to bring yourself into that place again. It's so nice being in this home because it really feels like you. Just Even just walking around these areas by the studio and looking around and ignoring the really sweet, poignant photos your mom has stacked up. <laughs> like perfectly. I know, like the dentist office. <laughs> it's, and they're perfectly stacked as yeah. well. It's like there's so many. Mama T. <laughs> totally. But it, it just feels very much like you live here. Mm-hmm. And I don't always get that feeling, not yeah. to put anyone on blast, but sometimes I'm like, oh, no, you tour a yeah. lot. This doesn't feel like your home, home. Yeah. This has got you written all over it. Has the idea of home changed to you after you lost that home and then you went through so much significant personal change? Mm-hmm. Like, what is home now? What is a home? A home to me is, and it can be any space, any size, that when someone else enters that space, they know it's yours. Hmm. And I don't think you would think anyone but me would probably live here. just called it. The reason that there's like the big screen behind us, I like to create animation, you know, so I can animate in here. I can do my music video editing in here. And it's really just, I think something about staying where the song is made, because like it kind of lives in here forever. You know, when you walk through a historic home or like Mm -hmm. a landmark, you can like feel its history. Mm -hmm. I feel the same way about my studios and my spaces. But then again, keeping that slight protection and slight detachment to knowing it can all go away. And it's all the stuff. And when I'm gone, it'll be someone else's. But that guitar, the acoustic guitar doesn't feel like That's my new. 
That acoustic guitar? Yeah. That's a 1957 Martin. Yeah, that's serious. Yeah, that's serious. And then I just got a... Yeah, I love uh, the Fender. A 19, yeah, she's from 1969. And I like that it was... She's a blondie, so I like yeah. that she was blonde. It's and, the only color for a Fender, in my 69. opinion. 69. It's my favorite color, blonde. Do you play them? Yeah, I play them. There's so many interesting musical references on this album, on Plastic Hearts. I'm so thrilled as a fan that you pivoted away and, and worked on a body of work. I thought that she is trilogy was going to be interesting mm -hmm. but when i knew that you were making an album i was like all right now i get to hear what the complete body of thought yeah the, the, like. the kind of she is era was i guess some sort of a representation of my uh i guess a little bit of a fear of commitment when it comes to having a f actually what you said it's perfect when we're talking about the statement having a full body of work it's saying, ready, here's yeah. Yeah. who yeah. i am yeah and when you make a record, especially the way that I used to actually make albums, you have to turn that in half a year before anyone's going to hear it. You're distant from it. You're, you're, you know, time heals all. Yeah. The songs that are filled with pain or love or yeah. life, or you're removed from it because your senses aren't really so attached to those memories anymore. And so I always hated making physical records. I'm so happy that we've moved into yeah. a new way of putting out music. Especially if you say goodbye to yourself every night. And that's what I'm saying. By the time, look, dude, this is daily that I that I change, you know? And I actually really don't like when people, you know, say that it's being fickle or you don't get to just decide, you know, actually me and what. We've gotten into an argument about this before because I said, you know, if I say something five minutes ago, that's what I said five minutes ago because I believed it. And so I, so he was like, that is unfair that you live your life that way. That's fine to be that way as an artist, you know, but as a person, as a friend, as, you know, I'm like, no, 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 no. He's just trying to get his own way. Like, he's no, no, pressing no. the buttons. I know, he, he, he's the master at that. I'm taking notes. But I've had that in a lot of, you know, friendships, mm. relationships, collaborators, because... I evolve just really quickly and change really quickly. And mm. everything that happens changes my experience. I'll be different tomorrow because of this, because maybe I'll realize something or something that was in here that needed to kind of be released, released does. And now I don't feel that way towards it anymore. This is about the most in the moment I've heard someone describe themselves in a, in a very long time. You talk about release, it comes at a, you know, you have to, you have to just like lay waste to stuff. And mm. on this album, on Plastic Hearts, I'm just going to go there, man. Relationships get a, tough time on this album. Yeah. No doubt about it. Yeah. Like brutal. Yeah. I like know. there's lines on this record that are just like, wow, serious sense of self-awareness. Mm -hmm. I will never be that person yeah. that you want me to be. I will never be that faithful person you want me to be. I will That's never so be able to That's so funny out of all the songs because Never Be Me is a song that even Mark kind of challenged when I first wrote it because Mark had made this Ronson for the record. Mark Ronson had made the most beautiful arrangement. It was something that was very simple. You know, he's not the guy, it's totally different experience working with someone like Watt or someone like, you know, Mike Will on Bangers. He does not have just like a beat library. Mark Ronson, it's, you know, it's an arrangement. Yeah, yeah. So he's not going through and flipping through beats and saying, it's not pick one. You know, you're not going through the rack and trying stuff on and seeing yeah. what fits. It's customized, which I adore. Yeah. And so it was something super simple. And the words just literally started getting like, pulled out of me and to, because you don't sit there and think those through no i actually had a, a really kind of uh intense conversation about that song the other day because men happen to notice that song on the record a lot more than i mean women do because i thought it was kind of like my bonnie tyler moment you right. know that's what i was really writing and i thought women go yes that's totally me but actually men are always like are you really never able to be that person you know i'm, I'm a tripper but this is how i think of songs and when i write a song like that I capture something that is in inside of me. I kind of call it like, you know, temptation or a little part of evil or a, li mm. a little bad, even though it's totally not evil to have that thought. But it's something that doesn't have to be who I am, mm. but I get to capture it and honor a feeling that I have in a moment. And I can capture it like a fucking firefly and have it and admire it, but it doesn't have to come with me and be a part of who I am anymore. Because... I'm really proud of like my loyalty that I have towards those that I love or, you know, down to the animals. I mean, I just, like when I love, I am very loyal to people. I mean, you could tell this by any time you've seen me or any of my team or, you know, I'm a loyal person. But there's times, you know, where it says, you know, is it wrong that in my mind I walk the line, I lay with fire, you know? And I felt that way right then. 
and I got to capture it and I didn't have to take it with me anymore. <laughs> so in a way, you get to kind of honor it and know that it's a part of you, but that it doesn't now have to be who you are anymore. This is the trade. Mm -hmm. If you don't get to express yourself through that thought and commit it mm -hmm. to music, to mm -hmm. art, to expression, it sits with you, it can fester, yeah. it can get really malignant, yeah. it can become a problem in your life. Yeah. You release it, keeps you balanced, mm -hmm. and guess what? Others hear it, they don't feel quite so crazy. Right, 100%. That's the trade. You feel, you feel less alone when you listen to songs like that. Yeah. And you say like, okay, this is human. I'm human, yeah. she's human, I'm human. It erases that divide between the artist and the audience. I don't like that divide. I wanna be, I am my audience, yeah. you know? And like, I don't even really like the idea of an audience, you know? I guess it's like the listener or, I don't even really like the word fans because in a way it's like, to me, I, I, this career has been so long from the age that I started, you know, who you are from the time where I was introduced to my audience mm. at 12 to mm. who I am now. They really know me pretty well. You know, we've had a very intimate. But you fought to pull that barrier down. Yeah, I don't, I don't like that barrier at all. Yeah, but it's an incredibly transparent mm. space for you to live in. If you're going to be transparent and remove that gap between the stage and the crowd, metaphorically speaking mm. this time, you have to show it all. You can't just show the good shit. Well, that's actually why I created a C stage on Bangers, and it was low. It was a couple feet lower than the stage because I didn't want people looking up at me. Right. That felt like some weird royalty or something. I didn't want this. You know, I want, like, we're connected. But we're, this, is like, a, this goes back to that thing you contact. said before where you said, you know, I, sometimes I feel guilty about the level of security and what I've been mm -hmm. able to build for myself in relation to the people that are, I'm sharing this existence with. Yeah, and you know, writing a song like Never Be Me, it's a sacrifice too, and it's a choice that I commit to because some of the songs I write, I am not ignorant to the pain that they can cause to the subjects. And a lot of the time have to choose again, is it worth it for me to release this? You know, and I mean, release it not to everyone else, but to me to mm -hmm. allow this thought or this feeling to come out and because it's giving it power. Like my dad says, you write it down, you speak it, you give it power. It's real now. It's something more than the thoughts in your head. Now, one thing that I've really been into lately is the, the voices in your head. I think there's kind of three of us in here. I think there's, there's that angel, there's the devil, there's the one that goes, well, this is what I really want. Yeah, but if you do that, then the repercussion. And then there's the person sitting in the back that's actually just observing. So, so this is kind of the theory behind it, is that if you're the listener, if you're the one listening to the voices inside your head, they aren't you because you're observing it. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, you're having the same thought as me right now because I'm telling you it, so you're computing it, but you're not me. And so the two voices in your head are not you. And the only thing that they do is create your perspective for you and kind of narrate your life and help you digest, I guess, everything that's happening. It's almost like a computer, you know, but it's not, they're not you. And so the voices inside my head, I guess, they're kind of the ones that also write some of this music. <laughs> but it's not necessarily me who's observing. Does that make any sense? You should read yeah. a book called Untethered Soul. I've heard so about that's it. where the concept comes from. That's what creates the self-obsessed borderline narcissism mm -hmm. that people re realize, oh, there's just a selfishness there or there's an inability to see beyond your own framework and it's really just because you're consumed by these voices. Yeah. But until you realize that, until you read that book, until you start to analyze and identify what your best pathway mm -hmm. through that is, most people tend to lean into destructive ways to quieten the voices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you recognize that behavior? Is that part of why you found yourself in and out of trouble here and there and doing yeah. things like that? Because you're trying to cope? For sure. I mean, I think especially just my experimentation, yeah, we'll yeah. call it, you know, with with drugs, with alcohol. I mean, I mean, all of that was just me, I, you know, sometimes I guess also wanting to excuse them and allow them to run wild. Yeah. Like in a way, yeah. getting messed up was a way of me allowing myself to do things that I never really would allow those voices to the chicken control. And the egg. Exactly. So yeah. I think now my life has been truly changed by the concept that I'm not the voice inside my head, that I'm just observing because there's like a piece to it of knowing. It's actually the way that it's explained in the book is you would never hang out. If those were physical beings, you would never hang out with the voices They're inside your, your head. They never stop. When you're watching a movie, yeah. it's like, 
well, did I turn off the stove? Did I whatever? If your friend was in there like, did you do this today? Did you put a gas in the car? Did you, you'd be like, shut up. Like, I'm just trying to watch a movie or I'm just trying to go outside and enjoy my garden or I'm just trying to take a drive with my mom. The thing that really made me just commit to this theory and really try to balance myself in it is my mom losing her mom. Because, you know, one day I was driving in the car next to the beach with my mom and I was thinking about something totally else. My, I was not there. I was I was there with her, but I was not there. I was thinking about the record. Did I turn in the mix? Do I actually like the way that Hate Me sounds? I'm still kind of annoyed with something that I chose to do on the last chorus of Hate Me. It still bothers me. And so I'm sitting there like, ah, oh, I really, I sh you know what? I should have told Lou Bell. No, I don't like that. And so I'm sitting there thinking about it. And I'm like, yo, do you know what my mom would give to be in the car driving next to the beach with her mom right now? The fact that these two voices are trying to steal this moment from me. Stay present. I am not them. So the presence is the one sitting and observing that's just at peace with where I am at that moment. That takes discipline though. And that's that, where I thrive. So luckily where, it's been a quick adjustment for me. Once I take it and absorb it, it's pretty easy for me to apply it. Isn't you know? there a part of you as well though, just based on what I've read and what I've, mainly what I've heard through uh -huh. your music, that as soon as you get discipline in something, you're like. Yeah, destructive. Well, it's when it no longer serves or no longer feels like it's a part of me anymore. I mean, that's a part of the constant shift of every second is, I mean, every second is changing me so much, which is terrifying really for everyone that experiences me. I'm my best friend, but I don't know if I'd wanna be my best friend if I wasn't in my own body. I've had to learn that it's not selfishness because I used to feel guilt Terrible with shame that. For it, yeah. I used to feel a lot of shame. And I learned that guilt and shame are different, changes your life. Guilt is healthy. You know, guilt is, if I don't wear my mask, I'm gonna hurt someone. Right. And so I need to wear this mask. Shame is a killer. Shame is never gonna it's help a you. I hate shame. So there is no shame in the fact that this is me. This is, I mean, there's qualities. If you're destructive and you're hurting other people, mm. you have to work on yourself. It's constant effort. But I would wanna be my best friend, actually. I'd be my best friend because of my loyalty. Because when I shift like that, I don't leave bodies behind. I take everyone with me for the journey. It's just like, you gotta walk fast. I've asked a few artists this question and the answer is universally the same, you know. Um, in, in, in having to focus on expressing yourself through your craft and learn about yourself in the moment and then ultimately work that moment, reach people and grant people, is what is the, what is the greatest sacrifice? And every one of them says relationships. Mm -hmm. I, def I agree. And I would say, cause see that's totally loaded. That, that idea is totally loaded. So now we have to go through and like, now I'm not a vague person anymore. You'd have to go through and dissect that because mm -hmm. in a way, the relationships that I get to create, and I know what kind of relationship most people are talking about because our minds and our lives revolve around love. Mm -hmm. It's all we want. But when you can see all the different types of love that you have in your life, mm -hmm. At times it's, you know, it's lonely and I get that and I get wanting to have partnership and I get that people want to create families and I, I really get the longing for love and for, but, you know, to me and only to me, it's an honor to find it. But, I mean, animals pair up, you know, it's instinctual. It's not, a, again, a choice. That's programming. Mm -hmm. And I try to not be a, a total servant to the programming because that to me is ingrained and like embedded and uh, probably every woman in my family line before me probably, you know, had, has had someone had kids and had like, so that's ingrained in me, but yeah. I don't actually have that idea. So if I can disconnect from, well, that's what I'm supposed to want, mm. but I don't and I'm okay with it. And I do, but sitting here right now, I'm just happy to sit here with you. Mm. There's nothing that I'm like, well, you know, if I had this, it'd be better. It's like, it always would be. It's always gonna be better. And you know what I've also learned is like when someone, you know, talking about timing, it's like, well, this isn't a good time for that. It's never a good time. It's never a good time for your house to burn down. It's never a good time to go through a divorce. It's never a good time for your grandma to die. It's never a good time. Like it's gonna happen when it happens and like acceptance and it's not gonna be easy. And I've also allowed myself, I've made myself sit in discomfort lately and loneliness. How have you done that? I will really turn off all my devices, mm -hmm. everything in my house, no TVs, no phone, no computer, nothing, no music, and just sit and let it come up because it will. And it hurts, it's Ooh. excruciating. Ooh. And I did it probably three nights ago and like, you know, sobbed by myself and like, I 
felt so good the next day because you cannot do this forever. And we live in a society where we're asked to just compartmentalize, compartmentalize, compartmentalize. Time. Distraction, distraction, distraction. Cannot coat, do coat, it. Coat. Move, exactly. Move, move. Don't look back. Don't look back. Don't Dude, look back. I mean, our ancestors would have had ceremonies for yeah. a month if yeah. someone passes away. Yeah. And I remember my grandma died on a day that it was like right midnight sky. Maybe I'd been out for two days and I was going to miss interviews. And it's like, do you think you could do that one? It's like, are you, I have to honor my grandma who, my grandma, my mom was adopted. And like, so if my grandmother wouldn't have adopted my mother, like, you know, it's so great. So, and also people, you know, have the attachment to where like, you want to have your own children, you want to whatever. I come from a mother who was adopted, who like, I have such a love for those who, take in children and make them their own and give them a family to be a part of because my mom, like, that cosmic alignment is wild. That must blow your mind. Blows my mind because she chose her. And yeah. somehow it's almost, yeah. I dare to say, almost as or more miraculous than having your own children because the way that you really can become a mother yeah. to someone yeah. who... The bio, you know, the kind of that biology, the, the DNA. Is that is part, nurture the, over nature. Yeah. Exactly. And like, there is no doubt, like my grandmother is my grandmother and I am so much like her. Yeah. So there's something I'm like really love about it. So with the relationship thing, instead of allowing that to just be a preset, I've tried to really push the reset button on these, on these like settings that we're all like, we're all kind of AI, I guess. When did you start to do that though? When did you start? I mean, obviously you could say that that's the pot, that's the frog in the pot of boiling water mm -hmm. and then it suddenly happens. But the way you've described it, reset, not preset, mm -hmm. it's perfect. So that to me is a headline. You got to get to a headline. You don't just work up to it. You just go, oh my God, mm -hmm. that's not me. So many great lyrics on this on this album, but there's a line in there where it's bad karma to have a double life, to live yeah. a double life. Yeah. Woo. Okay. That's a big lyric. Yeah. Wow. I wrote that sitting in traffic. I wrote that sitting in traffic and I I started with, um, you may think I'm ghosting, but the truth is I'm a liar. And it's mm. like, I saw you want to tell you, but you ain't a fucking buyer. And hmm. like, it was just the truth. And I got to the studio and Mark so many times was like, oh my God. Like yeah. I actually have cold blooded tattooed because I heard the word cold blooded so much when I was making this record. <laughs> but and Mark's calling you cold blooded. So, this is from Mike Will and he goes, man, you, man, dog, you are cold blooded. And I thought, I'm gonna go write that. So I wrote a song called Cold Blooded and it's not even on the record. But well, if we're talking about cold blooded, let's just double down at, let's the, go. at, at the table and talk about the line, I always pick a giver because yeah, I've, I've always, always been, been a taker. taker. Yeah. I have to. I'd rather just do it. I'll think about it later. <laughs> Kiss me bad karma. I had written this song, like, I think I was driving. I was driving to Mark's place in Hollywood, and then I revisited it after I hadn't thought about it for a little while when I was in New York at Electric Lady. He started just playing it through the speakers. He's like, I bet you forgot about this. You know, your freaking musical vomit that you created over at my studio. Mm. And he presses play, and I just start hearing like, ah, oh, uh, da, 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 da. and then with Joan, when I I got Joan Jett on the song, it was like, because he kept saying like, this is the most Miley record of all time, and I thought there's only one person who could own this record more than me. It's Joan Jett because that's who instilled that mentality yeah. into me. Yeah, cherry bomb. Yeah, you know, and it's like. I don't give a damn about my bad reputation. That's what that song is. Totally. You know? I own it. Yeah, never. And I and just. And by the way, you wish you had it. Yeah. You don't like it because you wish you were yeah. free like me. Yeah, yeah. Even the bridge is saying, like, I don't give a f. I don't believe in luck. That's why I do what I want to do. I actually don't believe in karma because if karma was real, I think we'd see it more play out than it does. I think that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Like, I mean, to me, I wrote that actually. I wrote that when Donald Trump became president because mm. that's the day I kind of thought karma might not be real. But don't you identify to some degree with Buddhism? Yeah. Applied, applied I, elements of that faith to your lifestyle? I just haven't always seen karma play out in the life that you're in right now. But that's the whole point so, of karma is you know, you might not see it. It's probably going to come back in another life. And that's why I said I'd rather do it. I'll think about it later. I'll think about it in the next one. Right. Whoever I come back as, they can deal with that. What are you hoping we look back on in 10, 15, 20 years time, when we're older, I'll be much older, mm -hmm. you'll definitely be older, and we look back on this, and what are you hoping that this time we got out of it? What's the harvest here? People originally, I think it was said that coronavirus was going to be an equalizer. I disagree fully. It showed the divide. It showed health is wealth. 
it showed the inequality, it showed the injustice, and I think it was just an eye opener. And I think all the issues that came to the surface, they've been bubbling. I mean, this volcano was bound to erupt. You said it yourself where sometimes you think it's the end, mm -hmm. but it's actually the beginning. beginning. Yeah. You know, I don't think it's over until it's it's over. And even then we're starting, yeah. It's starting again. And I just never believe it's over. That's what I wrote in the introduction of my record and mm. how I announced this album itself is that when something is over, we usually claim it as the end, but it's the beginning. And I really do think, saying. I do think it's the beginning. Yeah. Well, at the beginning of the album starts with uh, What the F*** Do I Know? Yeah. Which I know because a little birdie told me that that was the first song you wrote for the album. Yeah, that is. That's the first song I ever wrote on the in record. Fact, the first three songs you ever wrote for the album, one, two, three, knock yeah. them down. It happened to just be in order yeah. and I didn't even mean for it to be that way. But yeah. You know, in storytelling, it's like makes perfect sense. Sometimes when you're you're writing a book in a way, you know, and it's like someone goes and cuts the pages and put it around. You're like, what the hell's going on? Well, the opening lyric because I don't want to have another conversation, and you probably won't play me on your station. And it's yeah. all very much a de declaration of, in case you ever wondered, I've always been an outlier. Yeah. And every time that you've tried to include me in your gang, it's just yeah. not where I feel comfortable. I mean, yeah, that's what I took from it. Yeah, when it says, you know, um, I don't want to have another conversation. Probably won't want to play me on your station. I'm going to pour out a bottle full of my frustration here to tell you something that I don't know. It was a little bit about the frustration of the unapologetic way that I do write my songs mm -hmm. can make them feel, I don't know, maybe, the, I, I guess, more in an alternative space, you know, especially this last record, I would say. And me being a woman and this aggressive idea then makes it in a way, I mean, less mainstream because there's still there's still a politeness that's expected. For me as a fan, I'll make it real easy. You're a disruptor. That's yeah. what I think. And I guess when you listen to mainstream, then that means that there is a stream and I don't go with that flow. You don't. And yet that you keep finding there's yourself a dam in these. There. Every time I watch you show up to these parties and these award shows in these rooms, it's a fucking disaster. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> it's a disaster. Yeah. And I'm just like, that to me was the perfect musical reflection of that yeah. sort of contradiction of like, yeah. invite Miley. And it's like, you really want me to come again? Yeah. You know what's going to happen. Yeah. What, what What are you thinking in the moment when you know that you're in the middle of something, there's a thrash going on that you didn't expect, but damn, that's just what happens. That's just how you're built. So what do you mean? So you mean like people's reaction to my... No, even before that, when you know you're in a situation where something's just kind of out of control and mm. there's been a few moments where, where some really well-publicized mm -hmm. moments where the party, you've been at the party and the party's gone south, mm -hmm. right? And, and what do you think? Are you thinking like, man, why did I come here again? Or are you thinking like, this is kind of why I came, to disrupt things? I think that, and I actually learned this from Mark Jacobs. I did a Mark Jacobs show and I was talking to him about, you know, I'm like everybody else, and that's how I want to be treated, and whatever. And he goes, you're no, not. you're not. You're not, yeah. You're not. And he goes, I can put you in jeans and a white T-shirt and a line full of people in jeans and a white T-shirt, and we're going, there you are. Mm -hmm. And, like, you will never, ever blend in. Mm -hmm. You will always stand out. Even if you decide today you don't want to be you anymore, you're always going to be you. You're born with that. You're born with a, you know, there's a radiation, there's an aura, there's a, there's a power, there's a force, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it. That is you, so stop fighting it. 27 to me was a year that I really had to protect myself. That actually kind of really made me want to get sober was because we've lost so many icons at 27. It's a very like pivotal time. You yeah. kind of go into that next chapter or this is it for you. And I just feel that some of the artists that almost couldn't handle their own power and their own energy and their yeah. own force. It's an energy. It's, People call it fame, it's not. It's not, it's, it's an energy. energy. And I, no matter what, was born with that. And whether I sat here with you and this is where I am, or if I was at my friend's place, which is the homeless youth shelter in LA that Happy Hippie supports, I, I would still be me, no matter what. And there would be an attraction and there would be a magnetic pool that made people want to come to me. That's mm -hmm. who I am. Mm -hmm. And instead of thinking of that as like some sort of, you know, narcissism. I need to drink myself through it. Yeah. I need to take drugs. I need to and avoid narcissism it. narcissism is saying, guilty. I'm the best We're and shameful. no one is as, as amazing as me. That is not how I feel. I have so many idols, like, that I look up to that I just, you know, like Stevie Nicks, like Joan Jett, like Debbie Harry. Like, I am no way, I will never be done perfecting my craft. I will never be the best because I'll never be satisfied. But that's really, I think that's really what it is. I, I'm going to stand out no matter what. So I've just embraced it instead of trying to run from it and trying to like, you know. I, Join the gang. Yeah, I mean, me because being a teddy bear 
shaking my ass in a costume. Mm. Me not being a teddy bear, not shaking my ass would be the costume. Because mm. that's that's what it is. That's what I feel. When I hear that song, I see a teddy bear shaking its ass, and so I have to become it because that's what it is. And so it would be a lie, which I can't do. I you can't, can't lie. You can't lie. I cannot lie. That's why I'm really gullible. It's because I assume that most people aren't lying to me because, because I don't you lie. Can't. I can't. And I cannot. So even if it's like, yeah, but those two things you said, like we said, you know, they don't add up. It's like, well, there's been time between them. So, of course, they don't add up because I'm not that same. The same person isn't. What about when you say you thought I was ghosting you, but I was lying? Well, you may think I'm ghosting, but the truth is I'm a liar, which is about not returning text messages or returning calls. So you think like. That's a white lie. Oh, you know, you must have fallen off the face of the planet. I'm not a flat earther. No, that's called I'm not a flat earther. I can't fall off the face of the planet, bro. I'm being no, sketchy. That's not returning texts and phone calls. It's really called self-preservation. Yeah. But it's interesting that you say that you you simply cannot lie. I know another artist who said that to me absolutely straight face. Like, mm-hmm. I cannot lie. It is not in me to tell a lie. Uh-huh. What happens if you do? That it comes out just like it does for everybody else. It always does. Does it burn you though? Does it just crush you? And it's just like, ah, until then you just cannot. It do. ends up just coming out in some whack way. You yeah. know, it comes to bite my ass every time and it will. You know, I guess maybe there's karma. I guess it could be. But it's like, lies are too loud. I mean, the truth always is comes out. I mean, I guess for me. Was it like that in your house when you were growing up? I don't think my parents lie. My dad is almost honest to a fault. Like, if my dad doesn't want to talk to you, you're going to know. You're going to know. My dad actually told me never laugh at a joke that isn't funny because that person's going to go torture someone else with it and they're going to have to fake laugh. And now you're going to have a you're going to have this never ending bad joke that makes people feel uncomfortable and you're going to have fake you're going to be the reason why people are fake laughing and that sucks. What was it like growing up in a house like that when you have a dad like that that everyone thinks they know from some music. Mm. But they don't know. He's the know. most eccentric person I've ever met in my Which life. Which is a wonderful thing. Yes. Again, I think I think you said it by, you know, he is like one of one and none. That's yeah, that's it. He's the one and only. And that's like been my, I guess, my inspiration. You know, you asked me about what you feel about when you step in someone's home, the way that I dress. Like yeah. I just I want to be the only me. Because everyone is the only them. And that's what I really don't like about this new shift of, I mean, social media and like posting everything and everyone beginning to morph into the same person and the same features and like uniqueness to me, uniqueness is my religion, like just being the one and only. And I just, that is not a superpower I have. Now, this is another theory I have is that as unique as I am, I'm not special because I'm in a way, we're all just special. So if everybody's special, then one star isn't brighter than the other. There's a lot of qualities about me. That makes Mark Jacobs wrong. Well, I think I'm always going to stand out. I'm going to stand out. I think everyone has it in them. Right. You're a real empath. You are. I, that's what I think. I think you're just an empath. You mm-hmm. just love, you just want to adopt animals, and you mm-hmm. want your friends and your family to be safe, yeah. and you just want all the stuff around you. But, but equally, you don't want that to define you, right? Yeah. And I have the artist. Fair? I have the artist torture thing going on too. Sometimes, yeah. but like, I'm a little conflict seeking because it's creative, and like that's another thing. About, oh, you, you know, create drama in order to write by about accident. Drama. I don't mean to, but like, I like to feel. I wouldn't sad. have picture as someone who believed in accidents. I like to feel sad sometimes. Like, mm. I really like it, and I really like to feel happy. I really like to feel, and I like it because it's inspiring to me. God, how do you function right now as someone who willingly puts themselves into their feelings in order to go through that process and learn something new Mm -hmm. when there's so much to feel right now? It's been really overwhelming. I went like three days without sleeping at one point because the energy of everything happening was just too stimulating. Like it's how can you sleep at times like this, you know? And when there's just so much to do as an activist, it would be really hard for me to just like lay my head on the pillow and go into dreamland. Yeah, yeah. But I think dreaming is honestly, it's the like pencil sharpener of the of the creativity. You, do you know, remember like, your dreams. I do remember a lot of my dreams. I wow. remember a lot of my dreams. Do you write in your dreams? Do I write them down or like do I write in them? Do I write songs? Yeah, we, I we wrote anything. Thinking way too much from younger now in a dream. I <sighs> dreamt that I wrote it for my sister with Justin Timberlake, and I woke <laughs> up and I'm like, I'm just gonna write it. And I didn't give him songwriter credit, 
because it was dream Justin Timberlake. <laughs> he was not actually Justin Timberlake, but I had a dream that me, Noah, and Justin Timberlake wrote Thinking Way Too Much. Wow. Yeah. And it was the only song I'd ever written in a dream, I think. How do you remember a song after a dream? I can, I have vivid dreams, and then it's like, if I don't... As just... soon as I woke up, I had it stuck in my head all day. I had it in my head all day long. You clearly have a deep affection for the people, as you say, that you love and you're loyal to, and yet you've hit reset on mm. things. We were talking about your dad. I've also been lucky enough to, to meet your mom, mm -hmm. who's amazing. Yeah. And when I see them in the same room, I'm like, wow, that is just the perfect, yeah. perfect union. Yeah. So when you're in a situation where you're saying goodbye to yourself every night and searching mm -hmm. for a new moment to mm -hmm. apply it, to, to put yourself into, but then you see this union, this, this mm -hmm. loving family you came from, mm -hmm. right? See, that's really different too because I actually had this conversation with my mom this morning. Who you love and what you want can be different. So my mom loves my dad more than anything. They've created this family. They've mm -hmm. like, look at what they've created. Like they really kind of found in a way kind of a purpose of life. Like they really found love. But what they want is very different. And to say that love and agreement on a life path is the same is not. I don't think so. Mm. So I think my family really worked it out. My dad lives in Tennessee on a farm, pretty secluded, tripping out. His best friend's name is The Face. It's a tree that has a face, and he talks to it all day long. It's true. He's like, you want to come hang out with The Face? I'm like, Dad, you've been hanging out with The Face for 35 years. Like, I've seen it. And so that's my dad. And my mom, her life revolves around service. Like, she just wants to serve people. And, like, I mean, she is a mother to us five, but, like, she is a mother to everyone that she meets. Yeah. Like, she is just that person. Yeah. And yeah, she has incredible energy. She wants to live fast. And, like, they just have different choices. And so my parents really taught me that love is that feeling. Love is that spark. Love is yeah. something you can't see. Love doesn't mean, like, having a standard lifestyle where you sit and have coffee together every morning. So that makes me look for something else. There are some love songs on this record. There's some really, mo there are moments mm -hmm. when I feel like you're really getting close to truly identifying what love means to you. Uh -huh. Right? Angels is a real moment on mm -hmm. the record for me. And they're sad because I don't feel like it's there yet. Like you can't grab it yet. Yeah. But you're definitely getting it, identifying what it is. Yeah. Because to let go of something like and be able to write about what it means to you and let it go means you understand what it meant to you in the first place. Yeah. You know, at first, I guess a lot of my songs that I write are unapologetic and I guess are shameless, but not that one. So at first listen, you go like, Man, she's really putting it out there. Like, yeah. I know you're going to wish we never met on the day I leave. I know. You're going to think I'm cold blooded. But then it's like, it's not your fault. No. That's what it, this song is saying. It, there is like some remorse to it. Like, all these things should add up on paper to you're the one for me, but I know that you're wrong for me. And maybe it's part of being someone that thrives in chaos or some sort of conflict with creativity. I really respect, you know, actors that can go in and out of character and like leave it. In my love life, I should maybe be more like Denzel Washington or something. You know, I should be like a really good actor that can like play all these roles and then go home and leave but it. But isn't that the double life? I think that's really what it is. I have a hard time disconnecting from like yeah, yeah, yeah. that character or something because it's not a character. It's not written for me. That's the thing. Someone did say that to me one time, like in a relationship, you know, this is, it's like a movie. I said, but it's not because like it's not written out and the ending isn't folded up in a binder in these mm. like scenes like I'm not that person but it's like a movie it's like well actually I don't even like watching movies that much because I'm too embedded in the truth so when I know something is a story like I, I have a little bit of a hard time You're more of a requiem for a dream type thing yeah I love a that. documentary yeah. love that Me that's too. the that's the truth yeah. that I love you know I, I've actually like because a lot of artists they really get inspired by films actually I was working you know with Max Barton at one point and mm. he was saying he actually gets inspired by writing songs by even watching movies because he's like I can write a song for that person like I don't have to destruct my own life I can mm. write it from his perspective that's I'm not like, a good thing. it's not the same I gotta light it up you know so yeah. I gotta see it through I just that's who I am even a song like Prisoner you and Dua coming through and I and I man I mean there's some incredible songs I mean my favorite songs on the record are high end angels mm -hmm. but the biggest song on the record is prisoner yeah i mean that is just like so far out of the stadium and the ball's gone and yeah it's gone what i love about prisoner i mean i think it's also coming at a perfect time for everybody i mean in a way yeah the synergy between the, the subject matter on we, surface and what we're dealing and with here is yeah like, we really feel too like 
I mean, we're just trapped in our in our emotions right now. I mean, really me, there's no escaping it. And it's like, you know, locked up, can't get you off my mind. It's like anything that you try to suppress or compartmentalize at that point, it's coming up. Like it's yours to own, to own it or release it, you know? And so in a way, her and I, you know, we have a lot of things, you know, in common if you kind of look at us, like what? you know. I would say our love for fashion. This is like my number <laughs> one. Um, me and Dua both. She's probably the only person that can rival my collection of fuzzy hats. Like, we have a love for fuzzy hats. Yeah, there's a fabulousness there. Yeah, there's a fabness there, yeah. Again, I think that, like, fashion is such, it's it's your inside out, you know? And mm-hmm. so I think she, like, kind of wears her inside out. And mm-hmm. I, like, love that. Because I, like, when you walk into a room, like, she's recognizable. And to me, that's a star. Like, so when I know, if I if I saw that on a mannequin, and I would know that's for Dua Lipa. Mm-hmm. So I love that about her. I also love that she's very direct, like, we edited this video on text message, me and her directly as artists. And I just don't want to play telephone when I'm when I'm making music. Mm-hmm. I want to make it with who I'm making with. I don't want to do a song with someone's manager. I want to do a song with the artist. Mm-hmm. And so her allowing me to have that direct line of communication and then also the ability to like just trust each other. Like both of us, I think our egos are pretty in check that she's very willing and I'm very willing. And there's just... Also, there's a lack of competition because in the ways that we're so much alike, we're very different. You let her start the song. We're not, yeah, we're not competing. I'm just not like that, you yeah. know? Um, it's like we, we talked about, like, you know, me, either I decide I want to walk in and I'm going to, like, own the room, or I can just, like, slink into the back and camouflage in and you won't even know that I'm there, you know? You might notice what I'm wearing, but you, you or not wearing. But other than that, I don't have to be, I mean, I... I don't have to always be the loudest person in the room. I like to kind of slink in and like, I really like to observe. So I really like, you know, for her and I, there's just no competition. That changes, that's just everything. And, and there there was just a, there's a true partnership. And then I also like that it wasn't the first song we'd cut together. We actually cut other songs mm-hmm. and she wanted to keep going until it was right, until we found the one that honors our individuality. That's cool. Most people right. dial in, do the pot, bounce out, wait for it to come yeah, out. Exactly. It's another cut. And say, how quick can we do a video? video and turn yada, it? No, yada, yada, yada. There was none of the machine in it. And, wow. you know, she really, I mean, we've, we've recorded other songs together and we just waited until we felt like, now this is a, this is a duo on Miley song. And, you know, and you can just, everything about it reflects us. I mean, there's even something to me like how I talk about like fashion being a way to like flip yourself inside out. Mm. The colors that I see, I see, when I listen to a song, I see colors. Oh, don't ask me to say what that is because I can never pronounce it right. Synthesthesia? Yeah. That's why my studio looks like this on the top because that's what I see all the time. Wow. They're actually little hidden Is that vaginas. what your dad sees, do you think? Uh, hopefully, these are all vaginas. I'm not sure that he sees that. These are vaginas? Oh, yeah, they're all supposed to kind of be the portal of the womb. <laughs> that's where I came from. That's where I think I'm from. That's hey, here's a newsflash. It's where we all came from. That's where we from. came from. Well, this is the cosmic vagina, the vagina before you get to the, the oh, humanly womb. Yeah. The green in there is kind of what I saw when I was making Prisoner. Like mm. this song was, it was like very green and purple and it had a lot of color, like very stroby. Like it really wasn't like when I've written certain songs, it's just this like pale blue and there's a sense of like. You close your eyes and this comes to you. Yeah. And so when I close my eyes and hear it, there was like a, there's like a strobiness to it and like. I can kind of see it now, but it would go between this like really deep purple to this neon green, like kind of quickly. And neither of those really represent me. So I didn't really know where they were coming from, but like it was just, I really felt it. And when I think of her, those are kind of like the colors that I think of. Like I think of like neons when I think of her, maybe it's a part of like, I don't know, the radiance or like the power, I don't know. I kind of like vibe off people's levels of like charisma. Yeah. And so uh, like some people's charisma is really overwhelming. And I see, like, when Dua's around, that her charisma, there's no sense of, like, desperation to it, of, like, I've got to be the best because if I'm not, what if there's, like, a calmness to her success, which I really like. Because I feel like when you can tell someone is too much of a... Know, Trying like, too a, or hard. Or, like, a survivalist. Like, yeah, yeah. That I don't yeah. like. When I, there are some of the world's biggest pop stars have that. It's in the eyes. And, yeah. and there's this ego, but it's more... It's not actually an ego. It's insecurity, and it's it, it's fear. Like, yeah, it's, it's fear-based. Fear. It's fear. It's like when you're one, one point down with 30 seconds to go, and yeah. you've got the ball. I do not... Like, that energy for me, like, just doesn't work. Because mm-hmm. how do you explain... It's because it's not, like, confidence, and it's not security. It's something deeper than that. It's like someone said to me, 
one time too, like, you're such a free spirit. Like, you can't be held down. And I said, that's actually not true. Like, I really like to be anchored and I like to be weighted. Mm. I actually am not a free spirit. I'm probably my idea of structure is maybe a little looser than, but to me, I feel like I have structure in my life. Mm. And I wouldn't say that I'm just a free spirit. Like, I would like to work on maybe even my ability to go with the with the flow because I don't get a sense that after 2017 2018 was a step towards structure make mm -hmm. no mistake about it I mm -hmm. have the ideal house and the ideal location uh -huh. the marriage and da -da -da, I'm writing the music and blah, 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 this is going to be the routine yeah that all burns to the ground and ends yeah I don't feel like the person I'm sitting here is reacting to that I feel like yeah. you're still taking the good parts of that yeah I think I mean I also like rules and I I was looking at uh when I was reading that book about Joan Jett she actually said that she was a rule follower mm. and I thought that was really funny because I kind of thought it was like anti the everything opposite, I'm against yeah. but I actually really like rules like if it tells me not to park somewhere I'm not parking there mm. if it tells me to go a speed limit I will always go the speed limit like I like rules you because don't drive fast I don't I drive the speed limit <laughs> I'm kind of lame like I drive the speed limit <laughs> I think because I've caused so much trouble, I no longer have a desire to be in trouble. Like, I hate the feeling you get when you know you're in trouble. I got in trouble a lot as a kid, and I got in trouble a lot, like, last year, yeah. <laughs> yesterday. I don't know, man. I mean— I have I guess disruption is what it is. Yeah, and I've, right. I've maybe even caused a little, like, trouble in my life, but it's made the outcome worth it. So, like, I'm all I'm all content Everyone's with it. Everyone's doing shit all the time. But I don't want to, like— I don't. I don't want to go to jail. You know. I don't want to. I don't want to do anything like that. Right. So it's based out of fear. It's based out of fear. I don't want. I don't want to get a parking ticket. It sounds annoying. Yeah, yeah. You know. I also think it's a sign of respect. Yeah. I like respect, so that's why I like rules. Because if someone is doing it by it being caring, I think you know there can be overbearing, obviously abusive rules. Like you know, at some people just mm. like to be in such control and tell you what to do. I don't like those kind of rules. Mm -hmm. But I like rules that are going to prolong my life. I like I like rules that are going to benefit me and to protect other people. And that's why I love the damn mask. I love yeah. the mask because it's a sign of respect. By people wearing a mask, you're saying I love you. Yeah. You know, I just think it's a sign of respect, a sign of compassion, a sign of, you know, kindness. And like, I just think it's about being a good person. When you were 27, you needed to sober up because you felt like you were in a pathway that could have been a very sort of well-established, self-destructive pathway that occurs within the artistic spirit where energy is too big to maintain and so you end up losing your balance mm -hmm. with really tragic outcome. You want to stick within the, the guidelines that are set for us because they keep us safe. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to live a long life. What's your relationship like with the idea of mortality as somebody who lives in the moment as much as you do? I think that fear is just a part of instinct, like we were talking about. I mean, a fear of, of death is instinctual and yeah. it's programmed and that's, you know, it's, it's we are all survivalists. Actually, there's a, uh, a concept that says everybody is in it for themselves. It's just the more sophisticated that do a better job of hiding it, <laughs> yeah. which I think is really funny. Are you a survivalist? Could you live off the land? Could you go and do it? If, there, if I had to. Yeah. If I had to. Yeah. I mean, because when someone's like, I could never, it's like, but you would. That's the thing. And that's what the Glastonbury concept is of find your I would never, do it. And do it. And then find that place inside. Of. Yeah. And like, if I had to, I would do anything. You know, that's it. There's nothing else you would do. You will do anything, really. But maybe that's who I am. Look at you showing up with Billy Idol. This is a guy, I mean, he was one of the first concerts I ever went to as a kid, man. Him and Steve Stevens out on that stage. It was just, it was like, to me, they were like Lennon and McCartney. I know there's people who are going to be flipping out back then, but it was the 80s. The Beatles weren't around anymore. <laughs> Lennon and McCartney, man, it was like watching those two vibe off each other and playing those smashes. Mm -hmm. It was unbelievable. Um, what's the Billy Idol connection here? Because I know that you and Joan Jett have obviously gotten to know each other over the years, mm -hmm. but how's, how's Billy Idol show up on your So your Billy, party? Billy's kind of the same thing. Me and Billy have known each other. I think the first time... I ever did anything for Billy Idol was in like 2013. Right. I actually think that's when I had just dyed my hair platinum and like shaved my head. I had like short little spiky hair yeah. and I looked like Billy Idol. Almost like that? Yeah, kind of like that. Even, even more Billy vibes. Like yeah. I was pretty androgynous, you know, yeah. and, and I like really used him as a inspiration for my, my kind of like the transformation that I had. That was a big part of that for me, like his his music, because the way that he kind of married like rebellion, but also his music where they had like incredible hooks. And like big he hits. showed me that I could have balance, that I could make music that I and other people love. Mm -hmm. And like sometimes I've lost that and I found it again where it's like, I want to make music for me. But it's like part of music is sharing. Like, you know, it's not hoarding these songs, it's sharing. And so Eyes Without a Face actually followed me around for like a year. 
anytime I would go anywhere, it would be playing. Like, in a, it was really trippy. I really started to think that life is just all, I mean, it's the Truman concept. I'm yeah. like, who the hell keeps keep pushing play on Eyes Without a Face? Like, I'd go to the grocery, I'd go to a restaurant, anywhere I went, it would be playing. And then I went to the studio with Watt. I had said, I had just been going through like all different relationships and just figuring it out. And I was telling him that I felt like, I thought that Billy Idol music videos are like porn. Like, I think the old Billy Idol music videos are so sexy. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yo, that, like, that is my, that is my porn preference is mm -hmm. Billy Idol music videos. <laughs> right. And so I'm like, oh man, we got to write a song about that. And he's like, let's just write a song with Billy Idol. Let's just like get the real deal here. Thanks. So we, we got Billy to come and um, write a song and actually. Did you tell him about the music videos and the concept of the music videos? I think when I fell off and was drinking, there was a moment where I, <laughs> I told like, Billy Idol Check that, it out. that his music videos <laughs> are porn. I did actually. Yeah, yeah. I did. Um, and <laughs> yep, over dinner. This is a regular polite dinner conversation. <laughs> the chorus um, where it says, he says, under the disco ball. Mm. The disco ball I have is in my house in Nashville, Tennessee, and me and Watt were separate for New Year's. I was in Tennessee and he was in LA and we were FaceTiming under the disco ball saying, we're making the best record of all time. Like 2020 is our year. We're going to make this album. We we're so stoked. And we were under the disco ball. <laughs> and Come so, on. Yeah. So all I wanted. And then my other favorite story is uh, Ryan Tedder wrote this with us. And we're like all in the studio. And we're like, hey, Billy, like, can we just get a couple ad libs? And he goes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we're so like, awesome. please say someone was recording this. And we got it. And that was his real response to it was like an ad lib. Can't even say yeah without going yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. You know, I imagine like, Ian Asprey from the cult was like that. You're like, do you want to be? And he'd go, yeah, yeah. yeah it's like, it's for real. It's like, really, he cannot just say like, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. What's the golden G-string? We wrote this song, it probably was in 2017, 2018, something like that. And probably this, again, is kind of reflective of Donald Trump as president mm. and, you know, the men hold all the cards and they ain't playing gin, you know, and they mm -hmm. kind of determine your fate. This song, which is also about kind of the, um, I guess, like the cross I've had to bear in a way of like saying, like, I feel like everything that I've done has just been up for, you know, all the opinions and I guess people being offended and like all this shit. But it's like, you know, our president grabs women by the and you're mad at me. I'm a pop star. I'm supposed to do these things. Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to do things that like, or sometimes make you uncomfortable or you take offense. That's kind of my job. That's like entertainment. I don't want that in a leader, you know? I consider myself a leader, but I would say that actually is creating the like country that we're going to live in. You you, you don't want an entertainer. You, I don't, I have no desire to be president because I have only a desire to create art and to be an artist and to, I want to do what I do. And I think that there's an idea that I've kind of focused on of mastery of like finding the thing that you love and like becoming the best at it. You can't be everything. I think it's great. And I think, I don't know what next year is about. I'm really glad you put this album out. I still know artists that won't. Mm -hmm. I still know artists that are just like, I just can't. I, I just, understand. I do too. I understand. They just, can't, I, they just like, I can't do it and then not bring it to life and play it and do what I do. And but I live for challenges, and this yeah. is creatively challenging time. And I would think that a lot of the performance I've been able to pair with my music, I hope are timeless. Like, I really hope they're not coded with this COVID time. No, I think I said this to what? I hope you don't mind me saying. I, I gave him a compliment, and you were complimented, and Mark and everyone. I said, this is an album where I feel that the performer in you has been set free. Mm -hmm. There have been times when I've heard your music in the past and I've been trying to compare and contrast to when I see you when it's do or die. Mm -hmm. When you're on the mic and you're singing and it's you and it's like, if I don't get this right, it's a disaster. Mm -hmm. And you just go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And then I hear these perfectly constructed pop songs and I, it feels like you're constrained a little bit yeah. sometimes. It really came with age. And that's what we talked about with time. We talked about timing and like, I had some growing up to do, you know, and I did it and I um, am still in the process of it. That was who I was and who I had been and people had loved me for making 
pop music, you know, Party in the USA and like, we can't stop. And that was a part of a staple of my career that gave me some security. I mean, that's another thing we all want, right? So we want like love, we want security. Do you know at the time when you were making those records that they were serving a different purpose that wasn't necessarily an internal journey, but more a journey for security? I knew that I wasn't listening to songs like that in my (laughs) own time. I knew that like at home, I've never listened to We Can't Stop one time. I've never, but I've love it it gives me this like look you know it gives me a platform like and i love what it gives to people i love what people feel when they listen to it sure i love what it meant to me at the time actually at the time so see now these are where things are allowed to change and like i can say an idea and now i don't totally commit to my idea so now the new commitment of the idea is that playing a character for so long like I was a character and people yeah, loved me as a character I have a hard time not associating that certain songs that I don't relate to anymore were just another character that people love more than they love the real me so there's like the fear base of like people will never love me as much as they love that because that level of success is is such an eclipse sometimes it can eclipse anything that I ever make because when something is so bright and something is so big, or like Hannah Montana or like Pardon the USA or like We Can't Stop or Wrecking Ball, and, and then every time I make a music video, someone wondering, is she going to make another Wrecking Ball? Right. Is it ever going to be like that again? I may, like I don't know if I'll ever make that again. You're giving away your narrative that that's the thing. Yeah. You're giving away the thing that you owned when you made it in the first place, then it becomes everybody else's, and then you get scared that they just want that, and you don't own it anymore, yeah. and it's not yours to own. And yet when we spoke around Younger Now, I remember distinctly saying to you, that moment when you get up in your backyard and you sing with whoever it is or on your own, it is the most pure, like, what the f- moment like you've got this fire in you when you sing which is unbelievable second to none almost in your peer group and I you think that's batted why get- that shit away I remember three years ago I gave you that compliment yeah. you were like yeah yeah I like to go on the beach and sing on my acoustic guitars but I also like to make big fancy pop records yeah. whatever I think that's why I get sad a little bit when I put the record out is because it's really is life and death it's birth and death at the same time right. so like when you create a record now it's turned in it's burned on CDs it. it's burned on thousands of CDs already it's no longer mine it's everyone else's and all the ideas are out here now. Like they're not in its safe little place. Again, control. Like it's not in its hmm. vault anymore. Hmm. It's not in its vault. And it is not my precious secret anymore. Hmm. You know? And hmm. that is sometimes painful because my favorite part of the process is just singing and making music because I really don't know how I sing. I never really like focus much on like training or understanding or reading music or you know my grandma plays piano by ear my dad plays guitar just by what he's taught himself like it's just it's genetic and like it my voice comes from a place that I really don't know how when it comes out like my pitch is just there and I don't think about it like it just it just comes out and I don't really know where it comes from it's almost like you know, like Spider-Man like discovering that if he goes like this he's got the web it's like you know uh, it's that it's that like, I didn't even know. I mean, but even, even Spider-Man is like a, he's a showman, you know? He's like an entertainer. So, like, you want to see that show. You want the costume. You want the whole thing. And so, for me, that's why I fucking love Dolly Parton is because she has it all. That, to me, is just an ultimate icon because she's never lied. Her songs are the truth. Even if they don't resonate with her now, like maybe they're, she's attached from something she's written before. That's what happens when you have a career like that's as expanded as hers. But she just found this balance of being, she is a superhero. Like she almost has a character, but it's true. And um, that's why I love drag queens because that's what Debbie Harry loves drag queens. Debbie Harry, when she created Blondie, that was creating like a drag character because she's like, you know, I'm like, in a dirty band t-shirt in my apartment writing songs, but like when I become Blondie, and then that makes it sound different. I write songs in like all different ways, but like when I write songs, not only do I see color, but like I'll see what lipstick I have on. Cause I see the who's gonna, whose mouth it's gonna come out of. Like I see not the person that's like, you know, last night I was in a, you know, a sweatshirt like recording Stevie Nicks, but I'm not in my mind in my mind, I'm not. In my mind, we are like in our witch realness 
and like, I'm totally in Stevie's vibe and I've got a hat on and my hair is long and I'm like, the moon is full and there's like wild dogs everywhere and we're a part of it and we're one of them. And that's what I, where I am. I'm not in here. So like, wow. really like when I write a song, that's why sometimes it's even nice to write in unfamiliar places. Like, you know, I'll write, I'll, that's why I said I don't really write songs in here that much. Yeah. Like I don't really write songs in a studio. Yeah. I write songs in the car because they're just going to come to you like, you know. But I think by feeling that, because in in a song, like when you're writing a song, you can go anywhere in your like imagination. Yeah, look, when we spoke three years ago, I was like, oh, we're going to get to this. Mm-hmm. And so this is another step towards this. And it's like, just to be in a situation where I have no idea what time it is. I haven't thought yeah. about it for a second. For me, it's just like been a very fluid conversation about process around this album, which really just finds you at a point in your life where... It's self-awareness and acceptance and freedom. Acceptance keeps finding me. Like yeah. that word, it's the it's the eyes without a face of words. It will not quit. Like everywhere I go and mindfulness. Yeah. So mindfulness is following me also. Like yeah. I got just totally zoned into mindfulness over the last maybe four weeks and it's changed my life. And my final thing that I'll say of what's been extremely helpful to me is the best way to stay open is to never close. So last night I had to say that to myself repeatedly when I was like cutting Midnight Sky. I don't know what it was. It was something about it that, I don't know what, I was really getting like creatively blocked and like for some reason when Midnight Sky started playing, I just started crying. Like mm. I don't even really know why. I guess maybe the the fact that Stevie Nicks is on the record like blew my mind, but I also- I don't want to be an amateur therapist, but also it came out at a pretty dramatic time for your family when you lost someone close to you around the same yeah, time. Yeah, I realized that the person that wrote it isn't the person that's recunning it now and listening to it in a way that's already. And that made me sad, you know, because I was like, I'm listening to it and a lot has changed already. Like when things are different, I'm really affected by it. And like just by losing someone, relationship changes. Obviously, there's a big change in the country going on, like a exchange of power and there's just all this going on. And I'm like, last night when the song started playing, in a way, when I wrote it, I mean, but it's just another one. We remember the past better than it was, present worse than it is, and future more resolved than it ever will be. Mm-hmm. And so when I look at the past, I'm like, when I wrote that song, it was simpler times. And these are so complicated. There was a laundry list, if you would have asked me when I wrote Midnight Sky. It's always That's why same. I was writing it, was I just want to be in control of my narrative so bad. Mm-hmm. I, I hate when... The media creates my autobiography for me. Like, no, stop writing my life That's what creates the anxiety, though. Exactly. That is the root of it. Which ultimately, man, if it's one thing I'm learning as I'm growing, as I'm getting on in my life and and our kids are growing up and everything else, it's like, as and where you can, apply those two words that sit there just waiting to be used and are always at arm's reach, Mm. which I let go. Yeah, I love that. That's why I wrote, you know, on my record, it's like, I think you're really going to like this record, but if you don't, f*** you. Because it's like... I fucking love it. And I think there is a balance. I think that is the car, like, to me, like the best, you know, Carly Simon, like, I love You're So Vain because I love that the chorus, you know, that's as iconic as Happy Birthday. Like, that is like the simplest, most mainstream, amazing, but the verses are so weird and like so storytelling. And that's the one thing that I thought me, Andrew Watt, Andrew Wyatt, Mark Ronson, you know, we really found on this album is that I... Dolly Parton, I've inherited this songwriting. I grew up listening to Johnny Cash. I grew up listening to Joan Jett. And I I have that in me. But also, like, I've also grown up listening to Gwen Stefani, who really did that kind of best. You know, she got to just have the yeah. best of both worlds, to not be ashamed of anything. Yeah. Um, she really did. And how to find that merch, how to be everything, how to be the melting pot of everything that I've ever loved and not be ashamed of, that, of like some of my guilty pleasures of music that, you know, that I've wanted to, that have inspired me and like how to make it my own and just a sense of like the, the shame, just, just it doesn't, it's not helpful. So I guess what started that tangent was that, Originally, the shame came out, and now I'm just getting a little more hyper aware to go like, oh no, I actually don't feel that way. Detached, detached from that. I have a fear of writing new music because what I've been is so large. Mm. Not anymore. No, I'm really excited for this record to come out you because should be. it's just I. It's the most proud I could be of anything, and you know, again, I just feel like just so much gratitude 
towards the collaborators who helped me create it. You know, here's the, here's the thing: you'll make another one, yeah, and another one. And I already another. am. I already am. This song was this album was twelve songs long. Somehow I think it's fifteen right mm -hmm. now. It's I've added three songs since it came out. Twelve plus two covers. Twelve two covers, and now Midnight Sky and with, the Stevie, yeah, with, yeah. with Stevie Nicks. So wow. now, when I printed this record two weeks ago, it was a twelve song album. It's fifteen. So that's the great thing about digital. And you're already also. making another one. I can like, just keep adding. I love it.